power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, not just, just leading us in prayer, but uh, what you were sharing there about your mom. And um, boy, um, and, and that encouragement to, to pray and not give up. To pray and not give up. Right? That's uh, something we all need some encouragement about. Um, ooh, oh, here it is. My clicker here. Has anybody besides me in this room ever felt overwhelmed? Nobody else? Oh, great. I'm glad you all are. You, can, you have a lot to teach me then. No, no. But I, I think we all have it at some time or another felt like you're really. And, and I, I came across this image. This is my poster child for, for being overwhelmed. This guy here, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, poor fellow. I mean, have you ever felt like that? Like, like there's just this way too much that you're asked to pull than you really can. And um, uh, sometimes I think we get that way because we've heaped too much into our cart, right? Um, taking on stuff we shouldn't, or, or maybe we just let other people uh, pile a lot of stuff uh, onto us that, that really we shouldn't have let them do, but we don't know how to say no, right? Or as your, your therapist would tell you, you have poor boundaries, right? Um, but, but sometimes that's not really the case. Sometimes you just kind of, uh, you, you're going through life doing what you're supposed to be doing, and it just, it feels, you know, overwhelming, you know, maybe because of you know, situations like Dick was describing, something going on in your family that's just really, really tough, or, or maybe it's, you know, it's finals week for you students, um, or like an assignment you get at work that's just way, way over your head. Uh, maybe a situation with your health or, or with your finances, you know. Um, but at some time or other, I think we all, we all go through uh, situations and even seasons uh, where that's, that's the case. And, and often the things that we feel really overwhelmed by are really good things, right? Like parents, if you're in the throes of raising kids right now, that can feel pretty overwhelming. But, I mean, it's not like you, you, you can't do that. It's not like it's not a good thing, right? But it just feels kind of overwhelming. Um, and often it's a matter of timing, too. You know, things that maybe we normally could deal with very easily um, when you haven't slept <laughs> or, you know, it's, it's one more thing piled on top of everything else, you know, that can, can maybe put you, put you over the edge too. And, and there's also, there's no one size fits all with this, is there? Some things that, that you might find really overwhelming wouldn't be for me and, and vice versa. Um, I, was, I was thinking about this in relation, you know, uh, um, you know, Dick was witnessing to, we had a, a person die in our church this week, and, and, and I, I'm doing the funeral for them. And I do that a lot. I, have, I often officiate funerals, and I've had people say to me, oh my goodness, I could never do that. That would push me over the edge. Honestly, for me, at this point, th- that's okay. It's, I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's not overwhelming for me. Um, but doing, being responsible for the funeral lunch... That would put me over the edge. <laughs> I mean, because what's involved in this is you've got to plan, you've got to organize, you've got to shop, cook, serve, get people together to, to make a meal for like 20, 50, 100 plus grieving people with like two or three days notice. That would just throw me over the edge. Um, for a long time, the, the, the woman from here was responsible for a lady named, wonderful lady named Dorothy. Uh, and uh, she was doing this into her 90s. And I would, with real fear and trepidation, call her up to tell her that, you know, we had one coming. And, and fear and trepidation, because to me, this is like this huge deal that like, you know, I, it's like I'm asking her to, you know, to, to, to move the Titanic or something, you know. And, uh, and so I would say, hey, Dorothy, how's my favorite person in the whole world? <laughs> and, and she would she'd kind of sigh, who died, Bill? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, We'll, we'll, we'll take, take that, you know, multiply by about a thousand, the stress of, of, of planning a funeral dinner, and, and you've got what Jesus is thrusting on to his disciples here. Um, Matthew chapter 14, let's, let's have at this portion of God's word. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, Jesus said. 
And he directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. The word of God for the people of God, friends. You know, this is the, um, the only miracle besides Jesus' resurrection that all four gospel writers tell us about. Interesting, all four of them have this one. And um, in, in his commentary on Matthew, uh, James Boyce says that this indicates a, a new kind of a thrust, a new movement in Jesus' ministry uh, that, that he refers to, he calls it the withdrawal of the king. Because at this point, Jesus, he's more and more trying to pull away from the crowds and very intentionally be spending time with his disciples, with the 12, to, uh, to be teaching them and preparing them uh, for, and preparing himself probably too, uh, for his trip back to Jerusalem and in the cross uh, that he knows awaits him there. And um, when it says here, you know, when Jesus heard what had happened, well, what had happened is, if you read the verses right before that, is he's just gotten the news that John the Baptist has been killed in prison. And, and Jesus, he loved John. John was his cousin. Uh, John was the one who was, you know, preparing the way for him to kind of come and begin his ministry. And so, so Jesus is, he, he's grieving, and he just, he just kind of, he wants to, to get away, to, to get away from the pressures of, of having to be with, with a lot of you know, other people for a while and, and be responsible for them. And, and, I, and I put on the, the map, the map on here, uh, hopefully to help us kind of get a, a better picture of what's going on here. Um, sea of Galilee, it's not really a sea, it's a lake. It's about 13 miles top to bottom, and at the widest point, about seven miles across. And Jesus probably at that point is, is up here in Capernaum, which uh, for a lot of his ministry was sort of his adopted uh, hometown. And he's probably not going all the way across. He's probably just skirting a corner uh, to try to go. And, and again, think about if you've ever been to, say, um, you know, Lake Arthur or, um, uh, yeah, that's, well, that's Moraine or, or Lake Wilhelm up by Sandy Lake. You, you know, you, you, can, you can kind of, if you're on the shore, you can sort of see across corners the other side, right? And, and unlike those lakes around here, Sea of Galilee, you don't have woods going all down to the shore. So you can pretty easily see where a boat is going. And, and, and if you want to, you can sort of walk around or run around uh, and, and, and go and, and meet the boat. And that's apparently what's, what's going on here. And so Jesus, he, he wants to get away. He, he wants to kind of decompress, right? But he can't. <laughs> he can't. And, and sometimes that's, that's the case with us too, isn't it? You know, you, you, just, you just want to get away from all the stress at work, but, but you still got to feed your kids, you know? Uh, you, you still got to, got to do your taxes. You still got to, you know, be emotionally available uh, to the people that you live with, uh, even though you're, you're feeling pretty, pretty, pretty stressed out. So it says, Jesus had compassion. We'll come back to that. that I think that's key. And he healed their sick. And, and that in itself is, um, is pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, if you think about it. But the text doesn't make a big deal of that, probably because, you know, Jesus has done this. But this is Jesus being Jesus, right? You know, healing sick people is just kind of what, what he does. Um, but, but then it really starts to, to get interesting here. Okay, so healing sick people, that's no big deal. That's par for the course. Jesus has done that a lot before. Um, but now, what are you going to do about this big, big crowd of people that's starting to get hungry? You know, what are you going to do about that? Well, the disciples, they have their idea of what to do, right? You know, I said, well, send them away so they can go and, you know, before all the drive throughs close, right? You know, send them, send them out of the towns, the villages, they can get some food. But Jesus doesn't have any of that, right? He says, no, you, you give them something to eat. And if you look at, in, in the Greek, that you, it's in the emphatic position, meaning that's the word you emphasize. You, know, you give them something to eat. It's not, it's not, you know, go call four, five, eight, seven, nine hundred, which all of you know, right? Gepharos, Yeah. Why do I know that? I don't know why I know that, but I know that. <laughs> but you call, you call four, five, eight, seven, nine hundred, and they have them bring a whole bunch of pizzas, right? No, 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 it's not that. You give them something to eat. And at this point, that's when they become, you know, the donkey up in the air, right? Because this is just, um, this is just too much. It's too much. This task is way bigger than our resources, right? 
Well, we've seen, uh, you know, what Jesus does there to, uh, to solve the problem. And, um, you know, I was, I was reading actually a, a commentary on, on John's account of this. And it's very interesting because the, the author of this commentary points out that in John's gospel, one of the big themes is that Jesus is like the new Moses, the new deliverer of God's people. And, and he, he points out how, and draws a parallel, he says, you know, when God's people were hungry in the wilderness, that through Moses, God provided food for him. He rained down that manna from the sky, right? And he draws a parallel there. But, but what, what's interesting to me is the contrast. Um, you know, Jesus probably could have done that. He could have just, phew, food, you know? Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't just feed them himself. He gets his disciples involved, right? He gets them involved being the, the servers. Now, now whenever I've, 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 I've talked to anybody about, about one of the feeding miracles that we see uh, in, in the Gospels, I always like to point out how there are, there are some you know, really smart people who write articles and write commentaries on, on the Bible who will say, well, you know, what really happened here is that you know, when all these people saw the disciples you know, sharing their loaves and fish, they felt, oh, we ought to share our stuff too. So they started pulling out of their pockets and their, their picnic baskets, you know, all their stuff, and you know, they had a big old potluck there. Uh, you know, and the miracle, if you can call it that, would be the miracle of sharing. Now, I know when my kids were growing up in our table, that, yeah, sharing, that would have been a miracle. You know, just see our kids actually sharing, you know, especially the desserts, you know, with each other. Uh, it didn't, didn't, didn't tend to happen. Um, but that's reading a whole lot into this passage, friends. <laughs> reading stuff in that's not there. Um, it begins with reading in an assumption An assumption that the supernatural is not real, and so miracles can't happen, therefore this one didn't happen, and so we've got to come up with some explanation, and so let's let's try let's try this one, you know. Um, It's true, of course, that um, text doesn't tell us how Jesus did this. Doesn't say how in the world he made, you know, a couple of a couple of loaves and fish turn into a meal for thousands. Doesn't, doesn't tell us how that happened, but it's pretty clear that it's saying that is what happened, right? And, um, and remember, we're not talking about you or me doing this. You're talking about the person who is God in the flesh doing this, someone who is, by definition, supernatural, and who's been doing supernatural stuff uh, all along through here, Right? Well, like the disciples on, on the shore uh, that day, I, I often find myself feeling uh, overwhelmed. And, um, you know, certainly in, in, in ministry and trying to do what I do here, but, but more so even, you know, just in my role in my family, as a husband, as a father, um, as, as a friend to people, I, I often feel like, man, I, I, I'm being called to, to be about something that's really big. And... Um, and all I've really got, though, are, are just sort of a couple loaves and fish worth of talent, um, energy, and resources uh, to give to it. But you know, even when I feel that way, um, I still, I still, I really want to make a difference. You know, I, I want my loaves and fishes to really count for something. And my guess is that's that's almost all of us, right? You know, we 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 want what we have to to be used to really really count for something. Even if you're not feeling overwhelmed, you probably want that. Or if you're feeling underwhelmed, like you're just kind of bored and you're listless, you still, underneath all that, you know, you, you want to make a difference, right? And, and, and I know this, this probably, you know, sounds kind of, kind of grandiose, you know? But, but what I really want in these terms is, is I want something, something transcendent, something supernatural, you know, like those disciples, their loaves and fish. I, I, I want, I want somehow for the, the the little that I can offer to be to have an impact that's way bigger than what I put into it. You know, um, the wonderful news, though, friends, is that that's kind of what what God delights to do. <laughs> he delights to take the little that we have and supernaturally, in ways we usually can't anticipate or explain, expands it. <laughs> expands it so it has a way bigger impact than what we put into it. 1938, Otto Hahn 
is uh, the leader of a team of German physicists that discovers that when you split a uranium atom, that you actually, from the two parts, get more energy than in the single atom. And if you keep on splitting it, it, it multiplies exponentially the energy there, right? Actually, I said that this morning, and I said plutonium, and I had a physics teacher come say, it's uranium, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, so you got it, you got it right here. Um, but, but that's an extraordinary example from the physical universe, isn't it? Um, the thing is, though, friends, we can all be part of something like that, that, that expanding energy impact in terms of, of interpersonally uh, with, with others. Like, think about this. Have you ever given a gift to somebody and, and, like, the smile on their face and the ways they were blessed was so much bigger than the money and the energy you put into to giving that? Or, or, or maybe this has happened to you sometime as well, where somebody's smile or their hug or their listening ear just made your whole day, you know? Little thing from them made your whole day, yeah? And I think we see some clues in this passage to how it is that we can be part of having this kind of, kind of supernatural impact through what we give. Um, n- notice again, Jesus landed, he saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, right? He had compassion on them. Um, you know, when, when we're overwhelmed, often one of the first things to, to, to go is our compassion, right? Because when I feel just really stressed and overwhelmed, it's so easy to focus on me and my stress, my responsibilities, all the busy stuff, all the stuff that I got to do, you know? And being compassionate, though, that has to do with you and me focusing on you, on you know, your hurts, your needs, you know, your, your situation. Now, maybe the disciples' idea of sending the folks off into the villages, maybe that was motivated by compassion. They really wanted to see these people helped. I, I kind of tend to think it was more like, ah, I don't know what we're going to do, you know. Um, but, but either way, when Jesus got them involved and said, here, start passing this out, right? Start passing out this food to people. Well, well at that point, they, they were no longer just looking at a crowd. They were not looking at this big administrative problem, you know. They, they were interfacing personally with, with hungry people. And if you think about it, this must have taken a long, long time to do as well, right? And, uh, and I wonder if, if, if just doing that and getting involved that way, if that didn't tap into to something for them, you know, a, a way of looking at these people the way Jesus had been looking at them from the get-go, you know, with with compassion. If you want to have a bigger impact on your world, ask God to enlarge your heart of compassion, right? Hang out with some people to have more of it than you do. Um, Do the kinds of things compassionate people do. Show up at the funeral home, you know, with your neighbor going through chemo. Ask him how he's doing. Look him in the eye and listen for how he responds, right? Or, or when you're at school, you know, uh, you know offer to, you know, for that lonely kid or that, 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 um, that new kid, ask them to come sit with you and your friends at the lunch table, you know? Um, but again, you know, if, when you're, ask God to enlarge your heart of compassion. Um, most importantly, though, if you really want your resources and your talents to have the biggest positive impact, do like those disciples did with their loaves and their fishes, give them to the Lord and let him use them in the ways that he wants to do that. So, so what does that, that really mean, though? And, and what's, that, what's that look like? Well, first of all, it means getting to know Jesus as you, you read and reflect on and, and, and meditate upon what he's about as you see him in the page of Scripture. You know, what's he like? What's important to him? What kind of people does he especially you know, gravitate towards, and then day by day saying, okay, Lord, this is what I want to be about to. <laughs> you know, with my, my time, with my energy, with my talents, with my money, with whatever it is that I have, you know, I, I want them to be used uh, about, to be about things that you're really about. Now, that, that usually doesn't mean you go become a missionary or a monk, okay? <laughs> usually doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that, is that in your neighborhood, you know, in your school, in your workplace, with your family, you're seeking to live out Jesus' ways and his priorities there. 
it, it gives you some just, just, just pictures of what this looks like in, in real life. I think of a fellow named Lonnie. Lonnie was uh, a guy from a church we used to be part of whose gift was music. He, he, uh, he, he would sing, he could play any instrument, he taught uh, music, and, and because music was how he made his living, um, he was you know, especially attuned to, to paying gigs, right? Because uh, he made his living doing this. Um, but, um, but what's interesting is, even though he did that, he often found himself just making nursing home residents smile because he would do programs there like every couple weeks. And, and I don't know how many kids in, in our community, little kids, you know, grew a love for playing the piano or the trumpet um, because of the time that Lonnie would spend teaching them for free or almost for free. <laughs> And when he would play out, you know, these paying gigs, almost always it was in, a, in some, some very secular environments, shall we say. And, uh, and yet Lonnie would always pray, he said, before he would go and do those, he prayed that, that God would somehow, somehow show people through his singing, through his playing, just something, something of, of Jesus in that. Again, here's a guy who gave his, you know, five loaves and two fish to the Lord, and, and boy, it was just used to, to really, really bless people. Or I think about the 30-plus teens who next weekend are going to go on that, um, that International Justice Mission Freedom Fest. Now, are, do, you, do you think they're going to, going to solve the, the crisis of you know, human trafficking in the world? <laughs> they're not going to do that, no. Um, by the way, those disciples, they, they, they didn't solve the problem of hunger for anybody beyond that day. <laughs> they didn't. But what they did that day, what they gave that day, made a huge difference. And, and I really do believe that, that with these students, you know, the prayers that they're going to pray, especially more intensely, the, the hungrier they get through the time of fasting, you know, the funds that they're going to raise, it, it's going to somehow make a difference in the life of at least somebody, and probably you know, several somebodies who right now are just caught up in that evil web that is human trafficking. A huge difference, friends, that, that's going to continue long after any of these students have, have, have remembered how it felt to be that hungry you know, for, for a few hours. Right? What if, though, you feel like, man, I, I don't even have five loaves and two fish. <laughs> you know, all I got is no energy. You know, all I got is a broken heart. All I've got is, is, is a boatload of, of just anger and sadness because of all the brokenness that I see all around me in the world and in my own, own life. Well, friend, give even, even these things to the Lord and see how he can multiply these things that to us just seem pretty sad and useless. William Both, he was angry, he was deeply saddened by the poverty and the alcoholism he saw in the slums of London. So what did he do? He started the Salvation Army. <laughs> yeah. Young lady that grew up coming to youth group here in this church. Tragedy, her toddler died in an accident. She started a ministry that today ministers to a ton of grieving moms and dads. Yeah. You give what you have. No matter how, how small, how seemingly useless, give what you have to the Lord and see if he doesn't use it, see if he doesn't use you, you know, to, um, to impact the world in ways you never would have imagined. <laughs> One last thing on here, and it's not anything for us to do, it's just something for us to kind of to see, to believe, and to really rejoice in. And that is, you know, the cynical side of me, you know, when I, when I read a passage like this, I think, you know, what was really accomplished here? All those people are going to be hungry the next day, right? They're all going to be hungry again. And, and you think about it, every person Jesus ever healed, they eventually got sick and died of something else, didn't they? So what's really accomplished there, right? What's really accomplished? Well, in John's gospel, it's interesting. Right, right after um, he talks about this feeding miracle, Jesus, he, he, says, he says this. He says, I'm the bread of life, the one who comes to me will never go hungry. And then at the end of that, that paragraph, he says, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And while it's most explicit there in, in John's gospel, I, I suspect the reason why all four gospel writers remembered and recorded this is because it is a demonstration of God's power and God's authority in the person of Jesus 
to someday, to someday not only, not only you know, slake our, our physical hunger, okay, but to satisfy the deepest hungers of our hearts, you know, for justice, for mercy, to see sin and suffering totally done away with, you know, for unconditional love, you know, to see these hungers satisfied just completely and forever. Well, friends, the reason